Within this chapter, we will be discussing the legalities related to personnel management issues. Once completed with this module, you should be able to define sexual harassment, identify the components of a sexual harassment claim, and describe best practices for preventing or handling such issues. Identify the components of the Americans with Disabilities Act and apply the components to common scenarios faced by EMS organizations. Describe the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and determine how the Act impacts EMS organizations. Identify the responsibilities of the EMS organization in a drug-free workplace program. Identify the issues associated with random drug testing and other substance abuse issues. And analyze the issues associated with EMS blood draws for police-related matters and be able to apply the analysis to the needs of the individual EMS organization. So what would you do? Assume you are a female EMS provider and, while in the workplace, an EMS captain seems to always be critical of your work, stating on more than one occasion that older women have no place in the EMS field and that he is sure a better place for you would be at home taking care of your children and partner. You are a 45-year-old lieutenant and have repeatedly asked him to stop making those comments as you consider them to be discriminatory and they are creating a difficult workplace for you. You state to the captain that other workers are making comments to you about the behavior of the captain and wonder when this conduct will stop. You are thinking about reporting the captain's behavior to the EMS chief and the HR department. As we move through this module, consider this scenario and try to answer the following questions. Under what law or laws is this behavior discriminatory? What should your course of action be to stop this behavior? Should you report this behavior to the EEOC and request an investigation? If you quit your job, can you sue the department for creating a hostile and discriminatory workplace? As you will soon see, there are numerous laws in place to protect workers that identify with specific groups, such as gender, age, race, nationality, or sexual preference. To ensure compliance with these laws, employers must have policies that recognize and support these protections, which also means a method of recourse and reporting must be offered to individuals who feel they are being harassed by their fellow employees. One of the classes protected by federal and state laws is that of gender. Sexual harassment is considered to be a form of gender discrimination that violates Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Sexual harassment includes numerous behaviors, such as unwelcome sexual advances, as well as conduct that unreasonably fears with an individual's work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. The harasser can be almost anyone, such as the victim's supervisor, an agent of the employer, a supervisor in another area, a co-worker, or even a non-employee. While many automatically think of a male harassing a female, it is possible for a woman to be the harasser or for harassment to occur between two men or between two women. Harassing conduct may also have collateral victims involving others who may not have been the target of the harassment yet are still negatively impacted by it. It is not necessary for the victim to suffer economic injury or have to sever employment in order for unlawful sexual harassment to occur. To qualify as sexual harassment, the harasser's conduct must be considered unwelcome by the person being harassed. While this threshold may seem to provide some breathing room for an employer, just because the target of the conduct may not consider the attention unwelcome, there may be others who find the conduct offensive. As a result, employers are encouraged to take affirmative action to prevent or stop harassing conduct, even if the parties to the conduct are permissive. Another factor that can make this kind of conduct difficult for employers to regulate is that harassment may occur outside of the workplace. Whether that involves physical or emotional stalking of a person or other unacceptable social contact, if the conduct involves employees, the employer may be held responsible if the employer knew about or should have known about the harassing conduct. With this all being said, there could very well be instances in which the harasser may genuinely not realize his or her conduct is offensive or constitutes sexual harassment. As an employer, it is necessary to deal with harassment claims promptly, but keep in mind that some employees may simply need coaching to correct bad behavior, while others may require more drastic measures if he or she refuses to modify bad behavior. As far as sexual harassment is concerned, there are actually two types recognized by the law, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. 
Quid pro quo sexual harassment involves a supervisor-subordinate relationship in which an individual in power uses that power or authority to receive sexual favors from another over which that power or authority can be asserted. A supervisor who dangles a promotion in exchange for sexual favors, for instance, would be an example of quid pro quo sexual harassment. While sexual harassment in any form is illegal, quid pro quo is considered to be worse as the illegal conduct is arguably intentional and it directly involves the employer-subordinate relationship. If this type of sexual harassment occurs, employers are typically held strictly liable for the conduct and legal repercussions are typically worse for the employer than in hostile work environment claims. The second type of sexual harassment, hostile work environment, refers to situations where an employee's work environment is made intimidating, hostile, or offensive due to unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature. Such conduct could include the telling of offensive sexual jokes, offensive sexual comments, discussions about sex, or the display of sexually oriented materials. Under the umbrella of a hostile work environment are the actions of non-employees. It is possible for an employee to be harassed by a client, customer, vendor, or another individual external to the organization who engages in sexually related behavior that negatively impacts the employees. It is important to note that sexual harassment laws generally do not prohibit simple teasing, offhand comments, or minor isolated incidents. If such occurrences become frequent or severe, however, they can create hostile or offensive work environments. As a result, it is in an employer's best interest to eliminate such conduct in the early stages before it blossoms into a much larger issue. As an EMS leader manager, it is important to recognize your legal obligation to provide a harassment-free workplace for your employees, which includes recognizing and preventing all forms of harassment, both internal and external. Strong policies should be in place and enforced to prevent sexual harassment within the workplace. Within such a policy should be an anti-retaliation section, steps to follow for an investigation, and a general policy that prohibits harassment entirely, whether sexually related or not. The investigation procedure should include the steps the harassed employee needs to take to report the harassing conduct. The employee should notify his or her supervisor about the conduct, that the conduct is unwelcome, and that the conduct should stop. To eliminate a potential source of problems, the policy should include language that prohibits dating between a supervisor and subordinate. Admittedly, in some smaller volunteer organizations within small communities, this may not be a feasible policy. If such relationships are allowed, the EMS agency must be especially vigilant to ensure sexual harassment in any form does not occur as such relationships are ripe for quid pro quo issues, which gives rise to strict liability on the part of the employer. Handling a sexual harassment complaint appropriately is critical for an organization because a mishandling of the complaint could be considered complicit behavior by the courts, thus increasing liability for the employer. Depending on the policies you have in place, it may not be unusual to relieve the parties from duty with pay during the investigation process. It is also important to make every effort to maintain confidentiality within the investigation process. Ultimately, if the employer fails to mitigate the situation, the harassed employee can contact the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to file a complaint against the employer. The EEOC will conduct its own investigation into the complaint and, if the complaint is substantiated, will issue a right to sue letter to the harassed employee, which permits the employee to file a lawsuit against the employer for damages suffered by the illegal harassing conduct. Again, the employer must maintain a workplace that is free from sexual harassment. This duty also extends to the conduct of non-employees. To ensure compliance with all employer policies on the subject, periodic employee training must be conducted. Given the wide variety of people with whom EMS providers interact on a given day, it can be difficult to ensure a harassment-free workplace. Regardless, that is what employers, including EMS agencies, must ensure for their employees. Whether your EMS organization is full-time, volunteer, paid on call, or some other combination, the law applies across the board. Diligence, as well as ongoing education and training, are essential components in maintaining a harassment-free workplace. Another federal law that impacts the employment relationship substantially is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Passed in 1990, the ADA was the nation's first comprehensive civil rights law that addressed the needs of individuals with disabilities. 
The ADA applies to any employer with 15 or more employees. Title I of the ADA prohibits discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities in job application procedures, hiring, firing, advancement, compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Under the ADA, employers are required to make reasonable accommodations for qualified employees with a disability so long as the accommodations do not impose an undue hardship on the operation of the employer's business. What constitutes an undue hardship depends on the employer's size, financial resources, and the nature and structure of its operation. Reasonable accommodations may include making existing facilities readily accessible, job restructuring, modifying work schedules, reassignment to a vacant position, and acquiring or modifying equipment or devices, adjusting or modifying examinations, training materials, or policies, or providing qualified readers or interpreters. It is also important to understand that employers are not allowed to ask job applicants about the existence, nature, or severity of a disability during the hiring process. Ultimately, employers must ensure that all employee candidates are treated equally. As a result, the employer may ask about the applicant's ability to perform specific job functions, but may not specifically inquire as to the nature or severity of a disability. Once an employer decides to make a job offer, that offer may be contingent upon the results of a medical examination, so long as that examination is required for all employees entering the same or similar job. Such a medical examination must be job-related and consistent with the employer's business needs. Such a conditional offer of employment must be made to the employee before conducting medical or psychological testing or tests for the use of illegal substances. As we have noted with other similar laws, it is illegal for an employer to retaliate against an individual for opposing employment practices that discriminate based upon disability or for filing a discrimination charge, testifying, or participating in any way in an investigation, proceeding, or litigation under the ADA. The ADA is a broad law that is enforced by several federal agencies, depending on the type of violation that occurs. Some of these agencies include the EEOC, DOT, FCC, DOJ, and OFCCP. Please keep in mind that a disability does not necessarily equate to a handicap as many people are able to function normally, so to speak, with reasonable accommodations. The ADA requires employers to reasonably accommodate employees with a disability. What constitutes a reasonable accommodation will vary depending on the circumstances. If an employer feels an accommodation is unreasonable, the employer must show that the accommodation would create an undue burden that impairs the ability of the employer to effectively function. Once again, if physical or other testing is performed of employees, the employer must ensure such testing relates directly to the performance of necessary tasks. Another point to note is that the ADA does not require employers to create light-duty assignments if they do not already exist within the organization. If light duty is available for one employee, however, the employer will have to make light duty available to individual employees with a temporary medical condition or disability. Enacted in 1978, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act amended Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to prohibit gender discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. Essentially, it is illegal for an employer to treat pregnant females differently than any other employee on the basis of their pregnancy. This means that an employer cannot remove a pregnant female from active work unless the woman can no longer perform the essential functions of the job. For an EMS agency, this means that the EMS manager cannot remove a pregnant female from active duty out of concern for the mother or her fetus. That is not the agency's call. The expectant mother has the right to work for as long as she deems herself able so long as she can still perform the essential functions of her job. Once a pregnant woman notifies her employer that she can no longer function in her current capacity, the employer must treat her as it would any other employee with a temporary disability. This means that if the employer has light duty available for other workers, including those who are injured on the job, it must make light duty available to the woman. If no light duty is available within the organization, however, the employer is not required to create it solely for the pregnant female. An individual's age can also serve as a basis for illegal discrimination. The Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967 prohibits employment discrimination based upon age. 
Prior to enactment of this law, age was not a protected status under the Civil Rights Act. The caveat, however, is that this protection applies to anyone 40 years of age or older. It does not protect individuals below that age. The law does recognize an exception, however, if there is a bona fide occupational qualification for the job that relates to an employee's age. This is the provision that allows for mandatory retirement ages. The ADEA does not specifically prohibit an employer from asking an applicant's age or date of birth, but the employer must be cautious when collecting that information as employment decisions based upon age are generally illegal if it impacts a person 40 years of age or older. As with most of the federal civil rights laws we have discussed, the ADEA has a threshold of 20 individuals employed by an organization before the provisions of the ADEA apply. State and local governments fall under the purview of the ADEA once the entity has at least 25 employees. Within Wisconsin, however, this distinction is not important as State Statute 111.321 prohibits employment discrimination based upon age, among other protected classes, regardless of the number of employees an organization has. Generally speaking, the ADEA protects against age discrimination in hiring, firing, pay, job assignments, and fringe benefits. Employers are prohibited from refusing to hire, discharging, or discriminating because of a person's age, or limiting, segregating, or to classify an individual in a way that adversely affects employment because of age. The ADEA also forbids seniority systems or benefit plans that call for involuntary retirements due to age, and it makes it illegal for employers to indicate any issue related to age in advertisements for job opportunities. With that being said, there are age limits and mandatory retirement systems that can be enforced in certain industries such as firefighting or other protective services. Such systems cannot be a precursor or subterfuge for illegal age discrimination, however, and an employer with such a system must show that its age classification is reasonably necessary to the safe and proper performance of the job in question. While EMS can be a physically demanding profession, just because an individual is older does not mean he or she is unfit or unable to perform the job. In many instances, an older employee may provide unique benefits given age and experience within the profession. If an organization obtains a contract with the federal government or receives a federal grant, it must comply with the provisions of the Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. Even without application of this law, many private companies now require drug and alcohol testing. If your EMS agency receives grant funding from the federal government or contracts with the federal government, it is required to have a comprehensive drug testing policy in place. As far as drug and alcohol testing is concerned, an employer can test job applicants when an applicant is aware that the test is part of the screening process, the applicant has a written job offer, all applicants for the same position are tested, and a state-certified lab conducts the tests. Current employees may be tested if an employee's work seems impaired due to drug or alcohol use. Many protective service employers also require testing if the employee is driving a piece of apparatus that is involved in a motor vehicle collision, and some workplaces also have random testing processes in place. Current law that applies to the private sector permits non-union companies to require applicants as well as employees to take drug tests. If the workplace has a union, certain aspects of how the policy is implemented must be agreed upon through collective bargaining, even if the drug testing is required by federal regulations. Agencies conducting drug testing must follow standardized procedures established by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. While private employers are not required to follow these standards, doing so will help them stay on safe legal ground. Most drug testing programs test for amphetamines, cannabinoids, cocaine, opiates, and phencyclidine, which requires the use of a drug lab certified by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. With the increase in areas permitting the legal recreational use of marijuana, it is important to note that this legal use does not remove the right of the employer to maintain a drug-free workplace. Under the law, employers are well within their rights to terminate employees who have a second confirmed positive test, are under a last chance agreement, or refuse to participate in the employee assistance program. Employees who test positive do have the right to contest those results. Random testing is also allowed, although such results must be kept confidential and cannot be used in any criminal proceeding against the employee. 
Best practices for maintaining a legally defensible drug-free workplace include having a written policy, providing access to assistance, providing employee education and supervisor training, using proper drug testing methods for employees, being clear on state laws, having a precise written workplace drug usage and testing policy, and being clear on what happens when the employee receives a positive drug test result and on the consequences associated with policy violations. Employers can reserve the right to ensure that all of their employees are safe enough to work and perform their duties without being influenced by the use of drugs or alcohol. Utilizing a random drug testing program while also investing in a substance abuse treatment program can help employers reduce the overall cost of operation. It is very important for an EMS agency to ensure its providers are not under the influence of drugs or alcohol while performing their duties given the potential risk to the public, including patients. With that being said, the individual EMS provider also has privacy and personal autonomy rights that must be balanced with the public safety component of ensuring EMS providers are in full control of their faculties. Ultimately, drug testing policies raise constitutional issues related to both the individual EMS provider's right to privacy and the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. The ADA may also come into play as an addiction to drugs or alcohol could be considered a disability in some limited circumstances. The book is a little fuzzy on this point, so some clarification will be added here. Constitutional guarantees of certain rights are designed to protect the citizens from the government. The Constitution was not drafted to protect the citizens of the United States from each other. As a result, a public employee typically has greater protections against drug and alcohol testing than a private employee because the government employer must ensure it is not violating the employee's constitutional right to be free from unreasonable searches. This means that a public or governmental employer will face greater scrutiny in court if it has a drug or alcohol testing policy that does not comply with commonly accepted practices. When the textbook author says that a private employer may be more restricted in conducting drug and alcohol testing, he is referring to the fact that private employers typically do not have the public safety or security aspect to deal with. Being able to argue that drug testing is necessary for the safety of others is a strong argument for considering a drug test reasonable, and private employers typically are not able to make that argument as consistently as governmental employers. Within the realm of EMS, however, even private EMS services can easily make the case that its employees must be tested to ensure they are not impaired when driving an ambulance or treating a patient. So what should a drug testing policy actually include? The policy should include parameters for when an employee may be drug tested, which employees or applicants may be drug tested, and what job duties are considered safety related or security sensitive. All procedures should be as minimally intrusive as possible and respect the employee's right to privacy. The policy should also include a procedure for notifying those who may be tested and it should clarify how the results will be treated with a focus on employee confidentiality. If a drug test comes back positive, there should also be a policy in place to delineate the steps that are then taken given that finding. Drug and alcohol testing results are part of the employee's confidential medical record and employers must comply with ADA, HIPAA, and other state and federal laws that govern employee medical information. For EMS providers who are able to perform blood draws, there may be an instance where the police request that the EMS provider draw blood from a patient or subject being detained or under arrest. Performing such procedures against the individual's consent is wrought with legal complications and issues, especially if the evidence obtained from the blood draw could be used in the criminal prosecution of the individual. Even private EMS providers could be pulled into a constitutional lawsuit if performing such procedures under the direction of the police who are considered agents of the government, given potential violations of the individual's Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. If your service allows such a practice or is considering it, there must be a very well-crafted policy governing the procedure to address the constitutional and evidentiary issues inherent in drawing blood from an unwilling person for the purposes of potential criminal prosecution. One of the considerations in determining whether or not a search and seizure is reasonable or unreasonable is the permanency of the evidence to be collected. If an exigency exists whereby a police officer must seize evidence without a warrant to prevent the destruction or loss of that evidence, the courts will typically consider that as a valid exception to the warrant requirement. 
In a 2013 case, however, the United States Supreme Court stated that natural dissipation of alcohol in the bloodstream does not constitute an exigency in every case sufficient to justify a blood draw without a warrant. Given this decision, it is probably fair to say that the same logic would also apply to other substances besides alcohol. If your service performs blood draws for police-related matters or is considering it, you must have a well-drafted policy that not only outlines the specific conditions under which blood may be drawn, but it must also include the procedures to be followed to maintain the proper chain of evidence and ensure all documentation is correct and adequate. With such a practice, it is likely that your EMS providers will also be called to appear in court regarding the blood draw and the circumstances surrounding it. If this is something your service does or is considering, it would be important to ensure your policy was drafted with the assistance of an attorney familiar with this specific area of law. In many areas, EMS crews will not perform these blood draws for the reasons already mentioned and the police interface with a local hospital for such services. Returning to the scenario at the start of this presentation, what would you do if you were the 45-year-old female being harassed by your supervisor due to your age and, possibly, gender? To begin, the organization should have a policy in place that addresses this type of behavior, recognizing the right of the employees to work in a harassment-free environment, in addition to delineating that discrimination based upon protected classes, such as gender, age, race, and so on, is not permitted or tolerated. This policy must be administered fairly, equally, and consistently across the organization, and it should also provide for a reporting structure to follow if an employee feels there is a violation of the policy. Assuming this type of policy is in place, the next step would be to report the behavior in writing to the next person in the reporting hierarchy. If the employer is a larger one, it may have a human resources department or an equal employment opportunity office to which such reporting is made. The employer should then take reasonable, timely, and prudent steps to internally investigate the allegation, seeking facts from both parties and other witnesses to the behavior. The goal, if the claim is substantiated, is to stop the bad behavior and ensure it does not continue. If the complaint is not handled well internally, the employee may seek redress through external agencies, namely the EEOC, who will conduct an investigation and award the complaint a right to sue letter if the case is substantiated. Obviously, it is in the employer's best interest to ensure valid complaints do not reach this level, otherwise it could face some significant liability in court. In cases where the harassment is significant and the employee quits, it could be treated as a constructive discharge. This is important because employees who voluntarily leave an organization are typically not entitled to receive unemployment benefits and also lose the right to sue the employer for wrongful termination. Given a constructive discharge, however, the termination of employment is not considered voluntary and the employee has the ability to file a wrongful termination lawsuit against the former employer. Being compelled to quit given a hostile work environment is legally similar to being unfairly discharged. If not clear already, the management of personnel can be difficult and wrought with legal issues. As a case in point, claims of sexual harassment constitute one of the greatest sources of litigation within EMS organizations, and every EMS organization must have sufficient policies dealing with sexual harassment. The policy should be comprehensive, including a reporting mechanism, employee and supervisor education, and enforcement. Harassment complaints, including sexual harassment, and other personnel issues must be taken seriously by employers as significant legal liability could arise if such personnel issues are not handled appropriately. Laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act also have a significant impact on the management of personnel, and EMS managers must be familiar with the provisions of these laws in addition to others as well, such as the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. Besides requirements denoted in the Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988, EMS employers obviously have a vested interest in ensuring a drug and alcohol-free workplace. Such programs must comply with federal and state laws. Adequate safeguards must also be in place to prevent the employer's drug-free policy from being punitive to a particular individual or work group. Such a program must also have policies that are fair in both scope and practice. While not the case in Wisconsin, many states have codified the ability of EMS providers to draw blood on certain EMS patients under a suspicion of criminal activity.
That does not mean, however, that such activities cannot be performed in Wisconsin as blood draws fall within the scope of practice for ALS providers. Such practices, however, must be strictly governed by a well-crafted policy and procedure to ensure the agency is complying with applicable law. As an example of the issues involved with the practice, it would appear as though a warrant would need to be issued before blood can be drawn for most criminal investigative purposes. In conclusion, the laws that govern the employment relationship are numerous and complex. This chapter provided a very cursory overview of some of the most common laws that would impact EMS agencies, but these are by no means all of the laws that apply. If faced with a challenging or unique personnel issue, the EMS leader, manager, or agency is encouraged to seek qualified legal counsel to assist in the handling and resolution of that issue.